unnoticed by most of Africa and the rest of the world, a silent green revolution is steadily happening in Zambia. A new type of farming is taking off. It's called conservation agriculture and it's bringing benefits to thousands of smallholder farmers. Their numbers are growing year by year. So what is conservation agriculture? It's based on three key principles or pillars, as Dr. Stephen Muliokela explains. The conservation agriculture is based on three principles or three pillars, a minimum soil disturbance. You do only the tillage system which requires for you to establish an effective plant and maintain an effective crop stand. Secondary, you introduce legumes where you rotate your crop, you know. And thirdly, you must leave some crop residue to be able to provide soil cover so the soil is not left bare. What benefits does conservation agriculture bring? Above all, it improves crop yields and incomes. And that explains its growing popularity among smallholders. Esther Mumba, a local farmer, appreciates it. What we are discovering is that we are better off today compared to those years before we started conservation agriculture. And Noah Piri agrees. First year, when the, this uh, CFU comes in, uh, said, try this method. I said, well, I'm going to adopt this method, so I'm going to try it so that uh, I can see the difference. Yeah. So first year I managed to harvest 250 bags. I said, ah, this is good. The benefit is, is there, because I was uh, living in that house there, which is uh, built with the mud. Now I've shifted uh, from that house to this uh, new house. Here is how conservation agriculture is practiced in Zambia, step by step. First of all, small precision basins are dug after harvest, and these are maintained each year. Each basin is 15 by 30 centimeters, with a depth of around 15 centimeters. The basins are spaced at 70 centimeters, and the lines are 90 centimeters apart. The uncultivated land in between is covered with crop residues left from the previous harvest. As an alternative to basins, the land may be ripped using oxen with a locally assembled Magoya ripper mounted on a plough frame. In some areas, ox-drawn planters come fertilizer drills from Brazil are now becoming popular. A big advantage of this approach is that only 15% of the overall field is disturbed. This keeps soil structure intact and organic matter in the ground. In contrast, conventional ploughing disturbs the entire field, degrading the land and causing a plough pan as well. Lime and fertilizer are then applied with precision, not spread over the whole field. This adds to savings. Next, soil is backfilled. And the seeds sown immediately after the first rains into either the lines or the basins. This timely planting, crucial to achieve good yields, is possible because farmers prepare land during the dry season. Weeds are controlled by spraying low-toxicity herbicide before they set seed. So each year, the weed problem becomes less. Throughout the year, land is covered with mulch, a blanket of crop residues. This holds the rainfall and protects the soil surface from eroding under heavy tropical rains. With time, 
the residues decompose into soil organic matter and builds up fertility. This is effectively recreating forest floor conditions on farmland. After several years of mulching, the need for chemical fertilizer is reduced as the soil becomes richer in organic matter. Each season the crop is rotated to minimize pests and crop diseases and to keep the soil fertile. In Zambia, farmers rotate maize followed by legumes such as soybean or groundnuts and in the following season a cash crop like cotton. Conservation agriculture makes the land healthier which leads to other local and global benefits. In fact, it's an excellent example of climate smart agriculture with its triple wins. Production is ensured Farmers testify to sustained higher yields, often beginning in the first season. The system is more climate resilient. Conservation agriculture in Zambia deals better with droughts and erosive rainstorms. More carbon is captured. Under agroforestry-based conservation agriculture, soil carbon can double in a decade. But it's not just the technology that's so fascinating. It's the way it has spread throughout Zambia. Martin Shishakanu was working in the Ministry of Agriculture when conservation agriculture first came to Zambia from neighboring Zimbabwe in the 1990s. The, the cross exchange between Zambia and Zimbabwe was to start with was between the farming communities. The farmers union, the Zambian farmers union, that gave birth to the conservation farming unit. Alec Dacker, deputy director of the crop branch of the Ministry of Agriculture, picks up the story from the beginning. It uh, began from the 70s, where the government was subsidizing heavily on maize production. And because of monocropping, it's like the soils got depleted. And when we realized that the yields were getting lower and lower, um, the government ended up coming up with an issue of conservation agriculture. And that is where now they proclaimed that by the year 2015, we should have 600,000 farmers uh, practicing conservation agriculture. This target was outlined in the government's policy proclamation in 1999. It may have been ambitious, but already by early 2012, a quarter of a million small-scale farmers have adopted the system. Zambia is well on track to achieve its target of 600,000 farmers by 2015, half of the total number. The Conservation Farming Unit, working with the Ministry of Agriculture, has been at the forefront of Zambia's drive to expand conservation agriculture. There has been intensive training of extension officers and lead farmers, frequent exchange visits and continued scientific research. Noah Piri is a lead farmer, trained by the CFU. Uh, first of all, the CF trainers, coordinators, then after training us, it's when now we are mobilizing the farmers to come together and train them how to do this conservation farming. With conservation agriculture rapidly spreading worldwide, Africa is swiftly catching up, with Zambia leading the way. In 2010, there were visitors from Uganda. They eagerly took the message back with them and two years later, one village in that country had stopped ploughing and converted to conservation agriculture. This shows the potential of south-to-south -south learning. If farmers appreciate a practice and they can afford it, they'll pick it up quickly, often learning from one another. But the Zambian story doesn't end here. Researchers are working on making conservation agriculture even better. Here at the Gart Research Station, 
indigenous Phyderbia albida trees are being integrated into the system. Phyderbia grows strongly in the presence of the water table. According to scientists at GART, maize yields are around one-third higher under the tree's canopy. These trees are now 10 years old. Maize, cotton and sun hemp thrive below them. Phyderbia trees capture nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it through their root nodules. When their leaves are shed, they also enrich the soil. No wonder, it's known locally as the fertilizer tree. And uniquely, it's in the growing season when the extraordinary Phyderbia trees drop their leaves, allowing gentle sunlight through to the crops. The tree's deep tap roots reach for the water table and do not compete for moisture or nutrients in the topsoil. In the dry season, while most other types of trees shed their leaves, Phyderbia sprouts new foliage and its canopy shades the ground. Seed pods are formed, providing nutritious fodder for livestock. No wonder farmers like Noah are starting to integrate trees into their conservation agriculture practices. Not far away, Esther Mumba and her husband planted their trees seven years ago, and the impact is clear. Crops beneath the trees grow better and produce more. Nevertheless, there remain several challenges to conservation agriculture. Persuading farmers to give up the plough has not been simple. Furthermore, tools and other inputs are not easily available to everyone. There are competing uses for crop residues. And Phyderbia trees don't thrive everywhere. Finally, marketing of some crops can be problematic. Scientists can help improve the system further. But farmers make their decisions based on what they've already seen. Farmers like Esther Mumba. <laughs> After our first trial with conservation agriculture, we could afford to buy four cattle, so I realized it was very profitable. We have managed to educate all our children up to grade 12. We eat well at home. Last year, we started building a house, which we will complete this year. That's a huge benefit. Compared to previously, our lifestyle has greatly improved. Smallholder farmers in Zambia are feeding the nation and at the same time keeping their land healthy and productive. And for Mrs. Mamba, like thousands of others, the choice is simple. It's conservation agriculture.